It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Speaker, and this question is for the Premier. Everywhere I go, people are struggling. Their housing is not being built, rents are skyrocketing, and illegal evictions are becoming more and more common. But this government ignored recommendations from their own expert task force and cut funding for community housing by 70 per cent. It's never been more clear that we need more options, homes of all shapes and all sizes, in the neighbourhoods where people want to live. So, Speaker, my question to the Premier is, when are you going to start investing in permanently affordable public, non-profit and co-op homes that Ontario <laughs> The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, uh, first, uh, let me, let me, uh, let me too also uh, just say hello to uh, uh, Speaker Curling. Uh, he may know that he was the he gave me my first job in politics as an intern at 15 year old as a 15 year old intern at the Ministry of Housing when he was the uh, uh, the Minister of Housing uh, back then. So I thank him. He. Blame him. I know the House entirely appreciates what you've unleashed on the people of the province of Ontario, so uh, thank you for that, sir. Uh, uh, look, uh, uh, Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, uh, we have been focused since day one on, uh, on uh, building more homes across the province of Ontario, and not us building more homes, but putting the environment in place that can get more shovels uh, in the ground. I think that is the difference between us and uh, the opposition. Uh, uh, they think that by adding red tape, by adding government regulation, that somehow more homes get built. It has taken us six years to untangle the mess that was left behind by Spons. the Liberals and the NDP, which has put us, uh, which really put a pause on building home building in the province of Ontario. But we are getting the job done, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue on the path of reducing red tape, cutting costs to get more homes built. The supplementary question. That's pretty rich coming from a government when you have housing starts actually down in the province of Ontario. And my goodness, yes, we need market solutions, but we also need non-market solutions. This Premier has $100 billion in taxpayer money for his ridiculous tunnel fantasy, right? He has hundreds of millions of dollars to waste on private luxury spas in downtown Toronto and on his beer store giveaways, but he will not spend a cent more to support community housing. When the Premier didn't get his way with selling off the green belt to his developer friends, he just threw up his hands. They've got no other plan to reach their own housing targets. People are struggling. It's time for this government to get back in the business of building housing. It is your job. So when will the Premier get serious and start building the housing that people truly need? Members will please take their seat. Mr. Minister Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, in fact, uh, since this government came to office, uh, we put in, in place conditions that saw housing starts reach their highest level ever. Mr. Speaker, and not just... And not just single detached homes, and, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, but purpose-built rentals, their highest level in the history of the province, Mr. Speaker. Now, what unleashed, colleagues, what unleashed this opportunity is when we started reducing red tape, when we started eliminating all of the obstacles that went in the way, and when we reduced taxes and the cost of building. You know what happened? People started to get shovels in the ground and people could afford to buy homes. Now, when the Liberal and NDP in Ottawa, when they got into, the, the, into this, what did they do? They increased taxes, tax and spend, tax and spend, high inflation, which led to the highest increase in Bonds. interest rates in the fastest amount of time ever. And you know what happened? People put their shovels down, they couldn't afford. They want to tax to prosperity. What we want to do is unleash opportunity across the province, and we will continue to do that by removing all the final supplementary. Well, I think we all missed that on this side of the House, but let me tell you this, that the shovels are down right now all across the province of Ontario. The government's Housing Affordability Task Force recommended legalizing fourplex apartments in all neighbourhoods, and this government said no. They, they recommended legalizing density along transit corridors as of right, and this government said no. When we proposed to accept all of those recommendations, the government, the Conservatives, said no. Next week, we're going to give the government another chance. 
Republicans to say yes to these recommendations and to the most ambitious home building plan the province has ever seen. We're going to put forward our plan for Homes Ontario, a plan to make public funding, low Order. cost financing, public land available to non market housing providers so we could at least double the supply of permanently affordable non market homes, uh, co ops, rent geared to income all across this province. Will the Premier support our plan to get the government back in the business of building housing? Members, please take their seat. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker. What a relief it must be to all of the ORIA members who are here today to know that the NDP are going to put together a corporation that is going to build housing across the province of Ontario. That, that lot over there is somehow Order. going to bring to the people of Ontario that they Order. are going to build housing in Ontario. My gosh, Mr. Speaker. Now let's unpack their plan. Let's unpack their plan. They want to spend $150 billion to build. Wait for it. 220,000 homes. 220,000. Now that level of incompetence is only matched by the federal Liberals, yes. who are spending 1.2 billion dollars to build a housing accelerator in, in Toronto to build 2,000 homes, Mr. Speaker. What we are going to do is this: we're going to focus on reducing costs because we're not Response. interested in building a few Order. homes. We want to unleash opportunity that builds 1.5 million homes across the province of Ontario. Order. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, I'll say this, we're, we're still waiting. Where are, this one, where are the one and a half million homes that this government keeps proposing, please? I'm going to go back to the Premier. Last week, my colleague, the MPP from Toronto St. Paul's, tabled a motion to eliminate hospital parking fees. Uh, that was after we heard, of course, from so many nurses and patients who are paying hundreds of dollars to park at their workplace. We all know it's not just the workers in hospitals, of course. It is the patients, too, cancer patients people with chronic health issues, not to mention their families, forced to pay outrageous parking hospital fees. To me, that does sound like user fees, Speaker. So does the Premier think patients should have to pay for hospital parking before they get the care that they need? To reply, the Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health and member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the uh, province of Ontario has a housing uh, hospital parking directive. It is a directive that's been in, uh, in uh, place for several years now. And the goal of the hospital parking Order. directive is, of course, to keep down the cost of parking in our hospitals. Of course, the parking lots themselves are not owned or run by the province Order. of Ontario. They are actually operated by the individual hospital, uh, hospitals that run the parking lots. That being said, there is a directive that actually places a cap on parking fee increases. It is a hard cap. And in addition to that, there is also a special fee required Opposition come to order. five day, 10 day, and 30 day parking passes. And that's keeping in our policy to help keeping down the cost of Response. parking at our hospitals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Tell you what, let me tell you what the Premier said when he was asked why he won't remove hospital parking fees. He said he couldn't do that to the hospital CEOs. Oh. <laughs> well, let me, we'll all shed a tear, but what about the patients, Speaker? Yeah. What about their families? What about the workers in those hospitals? It seems like the Premier is actually admitting that his government underfunds hospitals by so much that they need to charge patients, workers, families for parking to make up for it. So can the Premier stand here and clarify his comments? Are hospital CEOs telling him that they need to charge parking fees to make up for his government's underfunding? Yes, they are. The member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, of course, the policy of this government is to help make parking more affordable at hospitals, and that's why we have the Hospital Parking Directive, which places a cap on any increase in parking fees at hospital parking lots, and in addition to that, provides that such parking lots must have a five-day, a 10-day, and a 30-day parking pass rate. But in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we all remember that 
in 2018, the health care budget was only $60 billion in this province. Today it stands at $85 billion for a 41% increase, meaning that Order. in the province of Ontario, this government is now investing more in hospitals than any other government in the history of the province of Ontario, including building a brand new hospital in my area of Essex County, Response. which for years, Mr. Speaker, for years, you could not get an NDP member to actually endorse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock for a minute. So the noise in here is getting a little louder by the minute. And I'm going to ask members to come to order, and if they decline to do so, I'm going to start calling them out by name. Thank you. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier is standing by while patients pay the price. That's the truth. Instead of taking any responsibility for how this government's decisions have left us in this health care crisis, the Premier blames patients. In fact, let's remember that he recently told patients to stop going to the emergency room and get this to go to their family doctor. It is so ridiculous. I, I honestly thought maybe he was making a joke. You know, you'll remember that he joked uh, apparently about patients going to the veterinarian to get an MRI. Also, not terribly funny. Two and a half million Ontarians do not have access to a family doctor right now. And even those that do have to wait days or months to see them because doctors are so overworked and so overburdened. Home care patients are going to the ER to get home care supplies. How can the Premier of this province be so callous Question. about the realities and the difficult choices that Ontarians are making every single day in this province under his watch? Members will please take their seats. Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker. With regard to connecting patients with primary care in the province of Ontario, as a matter of fact, this is actually uh, determined by a rating agency known as CHI-HI, which is an organization which deals with that type of thing. And CHI-HI reports that at approximately 90%, Ontario has the highest rate of connected primary care in the entire country, better than Alberta better than the Socialist Government of British Columbia and better than any other province in the entire country. That is according to the rating agency known as CHI-HI. Of course, one of those examples of connecting people to primary care comes from the riding of Davenport, Spons. where an additional 1,700 people have been connected to primary care at the Davenport Perth Neighbourhood and Community Health Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, look, this government talks uh, a pretty big game about getting tough on crime, but within a year of being elected in 2018, this government had dismantled the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. They said that their new administrative process was going to deliver compensation faster. Remember that? But the fact is, they're just delivering almost no compensation at all. Victims of crime used to be able to get a lump sum payment of up to $25,000 a year, which they could use to rebuild their lives. A survivor of human trafficking could use it to rent an apartment and enroll in school. A survivor of domestic violence could use it to get a divorce, fight for child custody. But now, under this Premier, all of that is gone. So, Speaker, is the Premier ready to stop the tough talk and actually get to work rebuilding Ontario's victims' compensation programs. To reply, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, it, it's been three years since we stood up the Victim Quick Response Program, Mr. Speaker. And, and what the Leader of the Opposition is referring to is a program that was, was wound down for a reason. Mr. Speaker, what she would advocate is, and her party would advocate, is that we keep a process where a victim who has gone through a heinous experience has to come before a board and retell their story, re-explain what happened to them, 
and get re-victimized through that process, Mr. Speaker. What we've put in place is an immediate response to help victims so they can get help from the frontline services, Order. so they can have doors repaired, they can have tattoos removed, they can have transportation, they can have victim supports with courts, Mr. Speaker. And all of that is immediate instead of a grueling, long, response. laborious red tape system that purports to help victims when, in fact, it was re-victimizing them, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. I'll tell you, Premier, before they, they, they point figures, this government needs to undo the damage that they have done to our criminal justice system. The truth is they cut $20,000 from victims and left them with a paltry $5,000. The ombudsman under the Liberals said yes, that that board was starved of resources. Instead of rebuilding this program, what did this government do? They just completely dismantled it. This is a story that repeats itself over and over again in this province. The Liberals starve our public services and then the Conservatives come in and kill them. So I want to know from this Premier, when will the Conservatives revive the compensation program and give Ontario's victims the real justice that they deserve? Members, will please take their seats. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What, what victims deserve, Mr. Speaker, are supports that are effective and timely. Mr. Speaker, we have invested tens of millions of dollars in victim witness support programs. We've invested millions of dollars in support programs for frontline workers to help those in their time of need when it's happening, Mr. Speaker. We have gone further. We have provided victims of human trafficking with free legal advice and support as they go through their trauma, Mr. Speaker. We don't need a bureaucracy and a red tape process that takes years to go through to help victims. We know what they need, Mr. Speaker. We are there with our victim services. Just last night, I was with the victim services of Toronto to hear their stories, their experiences of what they're doing to help the people of Ontario. And I have Fonts. to say, Mr. Speaker, I could not be more proud of this government for standing up for victims, standing up for people of Ontario, and standing up for the police in the front line. Order. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Yesterday, I joined the Minister to welcome an important investment from Hanan Systems. This is yet another vote of confidence in Ontario's thriving auto sector. You know, when we came to office, the auto sector was on the brink of collapse. And thanks to the previous government's high tax policies, we were there. But now, we've realized that the sector uh, is in better shape by lowering costs and fostering a competitive business environment. The world knows that Ontario is a global auto manufacturing powerhouse. Speaker, can the Minister please provide the House with an update on yesterday's investment? Recognize the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Speaker. Yes, I can give you an update because this company has invested $155 million here into Ontario. They are a global auto parts supplier. We met them in Korea a few years ago and convinced them to come to Ontario. The building they have built is spectacular, but what was most uh, their most vote of confidence was that their expansion is already started, Speaker. The, the steel is already up for their phase two. They're hiring 300 new workers to uh, uh, join them as they uh, make the electric compressors that keep the electric vehicle batteries cool. That's part of our end-to-end -end supply chain is being built right here in Ontario, and tens of thousands of good-paying jobs are being created created in the process. Bonds. We expect those 300 people to be hired now, and when we saw that expansion coming, we expect more to be hired in the future. Thank you. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his incredible and solid work for the people of Ontario. You know, Ontario's auto sector has been revitalized after years of Liberal decline, and investments continue to grow and flow in, and good-paying jobs have been created right across the province. So Hanan Systems' $155 million investment is fantastic news for the hardworking people in my riding and the surrounding region. When the Liberals uh, were losing 300,000 manufacturing jobs, no one would have thought that it would have been possible to land investments like this. But now, we've secured tens of billions of dollars of new auto investments that are creating jobs in communities that the Liberals turned their backs on. So, Speaker, can the Minister please talk about how Ontario earned the reputation as a global auto manufacturing powerhouse? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Speaker. Yes, think of where we were just a few years ago. In 2019, automakers from around the world announced they would be spending $300 billion in the EV sector and zero was coming to Canada. Not a single dollar was on its way here. All 120,000 men and women who were working in the auto sector were their jobs were absolutely at risk. When Premier Ford announced our open for business approach, we've now landed $45 billion in new auto investment. Speaker, that is more than any single U.S. state has ever landed in their own states. So here you've got Bloomberg now announcing that Ontario is now Spons? the number one wow. global location for electric vehicle parts, dethroning China for the very first time. Speaker, that's what's happening here in Ontario. Uh, the next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. I just, uh, my question is to the Premier, but I want to remind the Minister that when Oshawa plant was closing, the Premier said that ship has left the dock. It was actually the member for Oshawa that fought along Order. with Unifor to save those Order. jobs. Yesterday, we in the official opposition NDP gave the Premier and his Conservative government an opportunity to acknowledge that mental health care is health care and that mental health care should be included in our universal health care system. But they voted no to universal mental health care. The Premier clearly has his priorities all wrong. We're seeing community mental health providers on the brink of collapse and people enduring long wait times across the province for basic mental health services. Ontario needs universal mental health care now. We know that in Ontario, over 30,000 children and youth are waiting for mental health treatment. That wait list has nearly tripled under this Conservative government. That is their failure. Will the Premier apologize for continuing to fail Ontarians, change course, and finally bring universal mental health care to Ontario? Yes or no? To reply for the government, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you for that, that question. Mr. Speaker, since the moment our Premier created this portfolio, I've been working with my colleagues to build a functioning mental health and addiction system out of the mess that was created by the NDP and the Liberals. As we said yesterday, we won't take any lessons from the opposition. When they were supporting the Liberals, they had a chance to make and build a system, and what they did was nothing. Our government is the only one in the province's history that has ever taken these issues seriously. And the NDP demonstrated again yesterday that they're not still serious about this issue. While their plan for mental health is about press conferences and vague motions, ours is about expanding supports, building a system, integrating a system, providing supports from children and youth all the way to seniors. This is a system and it is being built by this government under the leadership Response. of Premier Ford. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue working to build a system that gets everyone the help they need where and when they need that help. Supplementary question. Speaker, back to the Premier. Actually, you were the official opposition under a Liberal government for eight years. That wait list went from 12,000 under you and the Liberals to nearly 30,000 under you alone. Under you alone. Yesterday, the Premier and his Conservative government refused to support our NDP Order. motion for universal mental health care. They claim that they are properly funding mental health. They claim that their record is perfect. Yet Ontarians are saying the government is failing to deliver the basics to keep people healthy. 
Dan Jennings, whose daughter Caitlin was murdered due to intimate partner violence, was only given six sessions with a therapist to cope with the grief and the trauma from his daughter being murdered. That is not universal health care. Another constituent, Kim, told me she can't access mental health support because she can't afford to pay $190 per session. So I will Question. ask again, why does the Premier believe that Ontarians shouldn't have access to universal mental health care when and where they need it at no out-of-pocket cost? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I will not take lessons from the opposition who had every opportunity to do something about it when they were in power Order. and yet supported the Liberals to do absolutely Order. nothing. This is the first government that stepped up and has a dedicated ministry who's looking after the mental health, not just of our children and youth, but all the way through, including addiction supports. We've, we're funding a $19 million early psychosis program. We're investing over $800 million this year in mental health and addictions. We've opened 280 of the 400 beds for addiction supports, which have seen more than 10,000 independent individual visits that are getting supports they wouldn't otherwise have gotten. We've opened up 22 youth wellness hubs in the process of opening up another 10. We've created Response. and embedded mental health literacy into the school programs. Don't preach to me what we are and aren't doing because we're doing a great deal to ensure that we... Ask the House to come to order. Order. The next question. The member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. Ontario's natural resources sector is the economic backbone of many communities, especially for families in the rural and northern regions of our province. The natural resources industries of forestry, mining, and agriculture support countless jobs and help to make Ontario's economy stronger. Speaker, the regressive carbon tax is driving up the cost of doing business in Ontario. And it's not just businesses feeling these impacts, it's families too. The Trudeau Crombie carbon tax makes life harder and more expensive for these businesses and families. Higher fuel costs mean higher expenses at every level, from transporting goods to running equipment. Speaker, can the minister please tell us about the negative impacts of the carbon tax on the natural resources sector in this great province? Great. And to reply, the Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thanks to the member for that great question. You know, jobs in rural and northern Ontario, businesses in rural and northern Ontario are often natural resource based, and they can't afford the carbon tax, but they can't escape it either. The Ontario Forest Industry Association said that fuel costs impact every stage of the supply chain within the economy and have compounding negative effects on industry competitiveness. How could you be more clear, Mr. Speaker, on the negative negative implications of the carbon tax. But let's look to our Great Lakes as well. And when we go there, we hear from the Ontario Commercial Fisheries Association that said the carbon tax increases the cost of goods because everything we do is shipped. Speaker, it's businesses that are being hammered by the carbon tax, but it's families too. It's the price of Response. food on the table, the price of heating in their home this winter, their employers, their small businesses, they're all being beat up by the carbon tax. There's only one thing to do here. The Liberals need to cut that tax and support the great people. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. Speaker, the impact of the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is being felt across Ontario's natural resources sector. These industries are critical to our economy, especially to our rural, remote, and northern communities. The natural resources sector provides reliable jobs in these communities. Speaker, the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax means higher fuel costs, making it more expensive to operate machinery, transport goods, and keep businesses running. This regressive tax is driving up the price of everything, and for everyone, from loggers and miners to the families that depend on, depend on these resources for their jobs. Sadly, every increase in the cost of fuel because of the carbon tax weakens Order. the natural resources sector's ability to compete. Speaker. What measures is our government taking to help businesses, workers and communities in response to the negative impacts of the carbon tax of the Trudeau Crombie era? Oh my goodness. Minister of Natural Resources. Well, Speaker, thanks again to the member for that uh, second great question. And you know, our government continues to make investments 
that support Ontarians. The Minister of Energy and Electrification developing a new green energy mix for Ontario and expanding our nuclear fleet. Congratulations to him for doing that great work. That means reliable, affordable energy for our manufacturing industries and homes and people in Ontario as we continue to grow our amazing province. The Minister of Finance has extended the gas and fuel tax rate cut to lower the cost of commuting and home heating. Speaker, we do this because we're putting the people of Ontario first. But as our government has always said, the carbon tax is the worst tax. Let me repeat that, the worst tax. It increases the cost of everything. Speaker, we're protecting Ontario workers, protecting Ontario families from the high cost of this carbon tax. We urge the federal government and those across the aisle to do the same. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I want to read out a statement made by the Premier when he was a Toronto councillor about bike lanes. Quote, we have to do everything we can to make sure there isn't a death in this city. One death is way too many. Premier, six cyclists have died on Toronto's roads this year. Since we all agree that one death is too many, why does this government want to rip up bike lanes that keep families, kids and workers safe from being injured and killed? Respond to the government, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Look, this is a sixth question period since we've had this policy introduced, and I'm happy that finally NDP or Liberals have asked a question about it. But, yes. Mr. Speaker, this tells you what you need to know. They know it's a reasonable approach because Toronto is one of the most congested cities in the world, according to the TomTom Tom study. Only 1.2% of people commute by bike, and it just does not make sense to rip up some of the busiest roads, not only in Toronto, but in all of North America, to accommodate that 1.2%. It's about productivity, it's about moving people, getting people to their homes quicker and faster. We're not anti-bike lane, but it does not make sense to rip up some of our busiest roads in this city, create more traffic, prevent people from getting to their workplace or getting home to their families quicker and faster. This government is about a reasonable approach to transit. The member for Beaches East York will come to order. Supplementary question. If this government was serious about addressing the congestion in the GTHA, that invest in transit That's and transit right. operations, right there. this government fails to do it. Actual fails transit. to do it. I, I can't hear what the member's saying. And it's both sides of the house. I apologize to the member for University of Rosedale. Please start the clock and she may resume. Bloor Annex Business Improvement Association represents over 270 businesses and property owners in my riding. Now the BIA has made it very clear that bike lanes bring more customers to local businesses. They improve road safety and they reduce congestion. Removing them, this is a quote, removing them would be disastrous for the community. My question is to the Premier, why rip up bike lanes when evidence shows they help small business activity and they help people get around from A to B without being injured or killed? Member for Etobicoke Lakeshore will come to order, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, I've spoken with businesses along that route. Balance on Bloor and Etobicoke. Mr. Speaker, 50 plus businesses that have come forward on the impacts of bike lanes. Look, we know 1.2% of people commute by bike in this province. Look at the winter months, Mr. Speaker. It gets cold, it snows, it rains, Mr. Speaker. It does not make Order. sense to rip up some of our busiest roads in this province to accommodate 1.2% of the population. This is about being reasonable. It's about moving people quicker and faster so they can get home to their families. And let's talk about public transit. That member right there has voted against the Ontario line, which will move 400,000 people every single day. That member voted against one fair. Stop the clock. 
the members will please take their seats. The member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. The government side will come to order. Next is an independent member. Order. Order. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development will come to order. Okay, I think we can resume. Start the clock. The member for Don Valley West. Speaker. In the 2018 election, the Premier talked big about health care, but it was all talk. We had no idea how bad his government could make things. Just how bad is it? It's so bad that under this Conservative government, the OMA says we're not facing a crisis, but a catastrophe. It's so bad that 2.5 million Ontarians don't have a family doctor. It's so bad that 30,000 people in my riding of Don Valley West, 30% of the population, don't have a family doctor. And it's worse in the Premier's riding of Etobicoke North, where 32,000 people, more than one in four, don't have a family doctor. Speaker, the government says there's no crisis, that enough Ontarians have a family doctor. But 30,000 of my constituents and 32,000 of the premiers disagree. They're living with this crisis every day. Question. Will the premier admit that 2.5 million people with no family doctor is unacceptable? <laughs> Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health, a member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, we have connected more people to primary care than any other province in Canada. We have more people connected to primary care than in Quebec, more people con uh, connected to primary care than in British Columbia, more people, and that percentage raises around 90% of all the residents in the province of Ontario are connected to primary care. And according to Kai High, which is the rating agency that judges this type of thing, we have the best record of any province in the entire country. But Mr. Speaker, we're not going to stop there. We've appointed Jane Philpott to assist us in connecting even more people to primary care in this province so that we can even do better to, from today Response. going into the future. Mr. Speaker, we are concentrating on bringing health care to people where and when they need it. Thank you. Member for Spadina, Fort York, will come to order. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's pretty sad that the gravity of 2.5 million Ontarians not having a family doctor is clearly still not sinking in for the Premier and his minister. That means 2.5 million people who can't get a referral when they need one. That's 2.5 million people who have to try to find a walk-in clinic or worse, go to the ER to get basic care. Does the Premier not think 2.5 million Ontarians deserve a family doctor? Every day I receive calls and emails from constituents sharing their health care horror story, about, and I bet the Premier does too. I wonder what he says to them. So when the Premier gets mad and tells people waiting in the ER to just go see your family doctor, what does he have to say to the 2.5 million people, including the 13,000 in the riding of Essex, who can't? Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, as we all know, Ontario leads the country in connecting people to primary care at approximately 90% of all residents in this province connected to primary care, and that's in accordance uh, according to the Kai High Rating Agency. But the member mentioned referral, and let me tell you a story about my constituent, Victoria. She had cataracts and she needed to have cataract surgery. And from the time that she was referred to the time that she got her cataract surgery, it was only eight weeks from the time of referral to cataract surgery. And that was because 
of initiatives taken by this government to make sure that cataract surgeries can be delivered at community health surgical centres, a centre which is opposed by the Liberals. We know that it is working. We know the Liberals would shut down those centres so people like Victoria Response. wouldn't be able to get the cataract surgery that she got so quickly. Mr. Speaker, I'm standing with Victoria and giving people better and faster health care. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ajax. Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. My community is feeling the impact of increasing safety concerns. We all see it in our neighbourhoods, on our streets and even in our parks. Parents are worried about their kids walking home from school. Seniors are nervous on their evening walks. And many Ontarians feel a growing sense of unease that wasn't there before. After years of underfunding by the previous Liberal government, our police and first responders were not provided with the support they needed to properly protect our communities. That is why it is so critical for our government to continue to take strong leadership and provide our first responders with the resources that they need. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain what our government is doing to provide our pro police force with the tools they need to protect Ontarians? To reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague from Ajax. And the question that I want to ask my friends in the legislature is why has our government, led by Premier Ford, decided to be so outspoken in support of our first responders, our police officers, our firefighters, and everyone connected to public safety? And why have the opposition been so silent? Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Associate Minister and I made, and pen, we made an announcement and we penned a letter to the Federal Attorney General and the Federal Minister of Public Safety calling for them now to enact meaningful bail reform and not to wait. We said to them we must restore mandatory minimum sentences for, for serious crimes. We must remove bail availability for offenders charged with murder, terrorism, human trafficking, Response. intimate partner violence. And we must mandate a three-strike rule requiring pre-trial detention for repeat offenders. Mr. Speaker, we will not stop. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. When we hear about crimes in our communities, we feel anxious. Ontarians want to know that their leaders are doing everything possible to keep them safe. It is a concern that keeps families up at night. And, Speaker, the people in my community want to see real action. They want to know that our government cares about their safety as much as they do. For far too long, promises were made by the previous Liberal government about community safety that sadly did not keep. And now we're seeing the consequence of those years of inaction by the Liberals. Through you, Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain how our government is taking the lead on public safety and ensuring our police have the resources that they need for all Ontarians? The Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, and again, I want to thank my colleague from Ajax. Mr. Speaker, this government, led by Premier Ford, will never apologize for making the investments that are required to keep Ontario safe. We will never apologize for fighting to get rid of those people stealing our cars and put them where they belong, behind jail. And Mr. Speaker, we have room for them. Mr. Speaker, we will never stop working to get the illegal guns off our streets that emanate from the other side of the border, and the federal government knows this. Mr. Speaker, when we were in Yellowknife, the Associate Minister and I spent two days it was like banging our head against the wall, pleading with the federal ministers to understand that in the absence of bail reform, we have lawlessness. And Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition and the leader of the Liberals are more interested in pandering those Response. in jail than worrying about the victims that have been victimized by horrible crime. Stop the clock. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Member for Waterloo, come to order. Member for Mississauga Malton, come to order. The next 
question. The member from Meshkigawak, James Bay. Mr. President, Speaker, between Thunder Bay and Timmins, there is only one hospital that has capacity to deliver babies. Pregnant women uh, all along this, this 800 kilometer stretch are told to move to another community up to four hours away to make sure that they have a doctor when they go into labor. Now, the OB department in campus casing is at risk of closing. Without urgent funding, we are going to lose the last hospital on Highway 11 where women can safely give birth. Will the minister commit today to finance and keep this last delivery department open? Minister of Health and Member Mr. Speaker, I want to first of all thank the fantastic midwives in the province of Ontario for doing the fantastic job that they do. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, it was a midwife that helped deliver our third child, Jackie and I, and it was at, at home Order. in a 100 percent all-natural childbirth. So I appreciate and fantastically support the midwives in the province of Ontario. I want to say that between the years Order. 2018 and 2021, the number of obstetrics and gynecologist specialists increased by 6.3% in the province of Ontario. And since our government took office in 2018, we've increased obstetrics and gynecology training positions by 11.43%. These are important increases, Mr. Speaker, because we want to provide these services to as many people Fonts. as possible, and that's why these increases have been undertaken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. I'm really sad to have to tell you that 7% of pregnancies from HERS were delivered without any obstetrical services. No midwife, no physicians, no obstetrician, nothing. From Thunder Bay to Timmins, we've had babies born in the back of an ambulance or in the back of a taxi because there were no ambulances available, in the back of their dad's pickup truck, and in bathrooms around the 800-kilometer road. Speaker, before this government took power, we had access to obstetric and delivery care in Northern Ontario. Now, Londoners are afraid. They are afraid that the minister will wait until a pregnant woman or a child dies before she will secure the services in campus casing, before she will restore the obstetrical services that close under this minister's watch. Northerners deserve equitable access. Question. When will the minister fix this crisis? Members, please take their seats. Member for Essex. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as part of the incredible increase in health care investments that this government has undertaken since 2018, we are increasing the number of doctors, including obstetrics and gynecologists, in the province of Ontario. The health care budget has gone from Opposition $60 come to order. billion dollars in 2018 to $85 billion in 2024 for a 41 per cent increase. And that helps fund the, in, the initiatives at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, where we are training more medical professionals, in fact, more medical professionals being trained in the North, for the North, than in any other time in the history of the province of Ontario because this government knows that it's important to deliver medical services to all parts of Ontario, including Northern Ontario, and that's Response. why we've had these investments specifically in the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and my question is for the Premier. In Waterloo Region, for every affordable unit that gets built, we lose 39 existing units. In Ottawa and Hamilton, that number is 31, London 24, and Toronto 18. This leaves Kitchener with a 0% vacancy rate of affordable units. So when someone loses their home, there's nowhere to go. One landlord named Michael Klein was recently named Ontario's top rent evictor by Acorn Ontario and was reported by the Globe and Mail to be linked to 21 buildings experiencing mass rent evictions in seven cities, including Kitchener. He buys properties, targets legacy tenants, often seniors, in an effort to push them out and jack up the rent. 
Allegations include tenants being bullied, harassed, and worst of all, given N13s, saying they have to move out for renovations, only to see units get a coat of paint and a dishwasher. What is the Question. government doing to stop bad acting landlords like Mr. Klein from making the rent paying seniors of Ontario homeless? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, and I thank the member uh, just the other day. She handed me a series of news articles uh, in relation to this matter. And I can't speak to the, to the individual matter, but I can tell you this that there, there is a, a process and a system to deal with it, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's an independent process. It's something that, uh, of course, uh, community legal clinics and individuals are accessing uh, the Landlord-Tenant Board to have these matters heard. There are significant fines for, uh, for what you're calling rent evictions for, for people moving out and, and being frustrated if it's not legitimate, Mr. Speaker. This government increased those fines significantly, and I trust that the Landlord-Tenant Board will follow through and make the appropriate finding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, sir. Um, while I appreciate the additional fines without justice, what's the point? Last year, the CBC reported that only four of the 13 landlords fined actually paid their fines. Their fines were $5,000, which for a senior who, got, who was made homeless or experienced this trauma is barely a slap on the wrist. As a result, bad acting landlords issue N13 after N13 after N13. In fact, the N13 use has gone up 300 percent between 2017 and 2022. It's no wonder neither landlords nor tenants are getting justice because bad actors are clogging up the system. The Premier himself agreed that the LTB is flawed. So will the Premier pause N13s, review their use, and implement barriers to stop those from bullying renters out of their affordable units? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, the last time we paused anything with the Landlord-Tenant Board, Mr. Speaker, it had knock-on effects uh, across the system, and so, Mr. Speaker, we're focused on getting rid of the backlog in the Landlord-Tenant Board so that it can function at its optimum uh, value. We've doubled the number of, of uh, adjudicators, full-time adjudicators. We're hearing uh, significantly more cases per month. The backlog is down over 30 percent, Mr. Speaker. We are on the way to success with the Landlord-Tenant Board. So that that tenants and landlords can have their matters heard in an impartial way, but I won't prejudge the hearings and the N13s that are being filed, but I can tell you they're being adjudicated independently, not politically, and the right answer will be achieved. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sarnia-Lampton. Thank you, uh, Speaker. <clears throat> My question is to the Minister of Rural Affairs. Ontario are feeling the harmful impact of the, impact of the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax in their lives. This regressive and unfair tax is driving up costs and everything. The Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is making everything more expensive from goods, groceries, and gas to heating, home, home ownership, and household essentials. I've heard from many constituents who are particularly worried about the negative impact of the carbon tax on their household budgets as winter approaches. They are worried about, once again, having to choose between heating and eating this winter because the carbon tax is adding unnecessary costs to their energy bills. Speaker, can the Minister of Rural Affairs please share her thoughts on how the carbon tax is hurting rural Ontario? Great question. I hope that the Minister of Rural Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Sarnia Lambton for that question. Because if ever there was an appropriate time to talk about how the carbon tax is hurting Ontarians, it's today. Because we have the egg farmers of Ontario here. And if you were down enjoying one of their omelets, you would have heard them absolutely in despair because the cost of carbon tax is driving up their cost of production, the drying of corn, and ultimately the cost of food. And another example of how carbon tax is affecting rural Ontario is the price on gasoline. We have to drive everywhere to get to piano lessons, to get to hockey, to get to church, to, to get those extracurricular activities that we deserve in rural Ontario. And in 2025, on April 1st, the carbon tax is going up to 20.9 cents a litre. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't afford the liberal ideology that's Response. driving this tax. Furthermore, when you take a look at people who have to use propane on a $1,000 bill, there's $250 worth of carbon tax of which... Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank the uh, Minister for that expansive answer. Speaker, rural families are being hit hardest by the rising cost of living. They don't have access to transit options like those in major cities like Toronto. That is why they must rely on their vehicles to get to work, drop their kids at school, or go to the grocery store. Rural families are paying more for some necessities, all because of the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax, which takes more money out of their pockets each and every year. When the cost of gas goes up, and impacts everything they rely on, from groceries to farm equipment. Rural families feel like they're being left behind by the Trudy Crom Trudeau Crombo oh great, uh, Trudeau Crombie Liberals who don't understand their way of life. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to help these families keep Great more question. of their hard-earned money? Reply, Mr. Affairs. Much, Mr. Speaker. Every day we are standing up fighting against the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax. It's nothing but a cash grab. But what I'm really happy to share with everyone in the House today and watching is that it's our government, under the leadership of both Premier Ford and our Finance Minister, that's doing everything we can to leave money in people's pockets. You know, we heard the Minister of Natural Resources refer to the fact that we're extending the decrease in provincial gasoline tax through to June of 2025. And more importantly, tomorrow in the fall economic statement, you're going to hear how we are going to give more money back to every taxpayer and child in the province of Ontario. 12.5 million taxpayers, 2.5 million kids will be receiving $200 to help them get through the tough times. Response. I want to say thank you to Premier Ford, thank you to Minister Beth Falvey. It's the Ontario PC government that is making sure that we take care of... Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, PEGO, the professional engineers of the province of Ontario, are taking strike action for the first time in 35 years. Wow. These are qualified professionals that don't get a lot of money for their field. They're responsible for ensuring that $85 billion in public infrastructure is safe and reliable, but they're not being valued by the Conservative government. After 16 months at the bargaining table, their in-house expertise is still being treated as an inconvenient expense. We need these engineers, Speaker, if we're going to build great infrastructure, and we can't afford for them to leave public service. My question, Speaker, to the Premier is, what is the Premier doing to ensure Ontario maintains the vital engineering talent in our public sector? President of the Treasury Board. Yeah. Speaker, the government's goal is to, ne to negotiate reasonable collective agreements that are fair and equi uh, equitable to Ontario's dedicated public servants, that are in line with legislative requirements, and that are also that support the long-term fiscal sustainability of this province. Now, since July of 2023, the government has held numerous bargaining sessions with PAYGO in an effort to reach a fair deal at the negotiating table. The government's later, latest offer, Speaker, recognizes the specialized role of PEGO employees. Now, out of respect for the collective bargaining process, it would be inappropriate to comment further, Speaker, but I want to assure Ontarians that all government ministries have continuity of operation plans in place to help them manage through any potential disruptions from labour actions, any impacts to programs, Response. services, and OPS operations, Speaker, are expected to be minimal. Yeah. Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. This government says infrastructure is a priority, but it's not investing in the in-house engineering professionals who go above and beyond. PEGO members are involved in the design, planning, and oversight of billions of dollars in infrastructure projects, and it's not just construction projects. These engineers monitor our water and air quality, mine safety, and much more. When we invest in them, we invest in our future. This Premier's priorities are all wrong. Is infrastructure really a priority for this province, or is this government going to risk a construction season by refusing to respect their own engineers? President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, infrastructure is one of our government's top priorities, and that's why we've made significant investments in health care, in transportation. Across the board, Speaker, we're investing in infrastructure, and that's exactly why all government ministries have continuity of operation plans in place to help them manage any potential labour disruptions. 
Speaker, the government's latest offer recognizes the specialized role that PAYGO employees play in our government. But out of respect for the collective bargaining process, I won't comment any further, but I will, I want to assure Ontarians that we are going to continue to build the province that Ontarians deserve. We will get it done. Thank you. The next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott-Russell. Speaker, my question is to the Minister, the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. A great minister. It's uh, no secret that Ontario is facing a major challenge in the skills trade sector. Thousands of skills trade workers, the people who have literally built our roads, our homes and our communities on, are on the verge of retirement. Uh, these are the same uh, workers who've helped create the Ontario we know and love. But without the, a new generation stepping in, all this valuable experience, all this know-how could be lost. At the same time, we know countless young Ontarians may not see university as the right path for them as they want to work with their hands and build. Yet, too often, students and their families aren't aware of many rewarding, well-paying careers available in the, tr in the skills trade. Speaker, can Question. the minister please explain what our government is doing to get more young people into the skills trade? Minister of Labour, Immigration and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question and being such a champion for our next generation, Speaker. You know, it's exciting, Speaker. We've launched the largest ever skilled trades career fair in Ontario's history, empowering 35 to 40,000 new youth this year with incredible opportunities opening up pathways into the skilled trades. I had the privilege of being in Coburg recently uh, for the launch of the Level Up Skilled Trades Career Fairs, and the most common thing I heard heard from youth was I've never tried this before. That's what this government are on a mission to do, to replace the one in three uh, incredible journey persons retiring, the golden generation that built this province. We owe it to them to ensure we're training a next generation to build the public transit, build the hospitals, build the schools Response. that this government, that this premier are committed to building, and we're doing it by inspiring the next generation. So big shout out to all the unions, teachers, educators, and employers who are taking part. Supplementary question. Speaker, Ontario urgently needs more worker in the skills trade to meet the growing demand for housing, roads, hospitals, and other critical infrastructure. Yeah. But, Speaker, despite the excellent job opportunities available, women are still vastly underrepresented in the trades, making up only a small part of this workforce. This isn't just about numbers. It's a missed chance to harness the skills and talents of skills, hardworking, hardworking women who could thrive in these careers and bring valuable new perspectives. P Speaker, we have heard directly from tradeswomen about the obstacle they face. Equipment that doesn't fit properly, limited or inadequate washroom, and even safety issues. If we're serious about welcoming women into the trades, we must address these challenges directly. Speaker, Question. can the Minister share what specific actions our government is taking to make skills, trades, workplace more accessible and welcoming for women across Ontario? Here, here. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to that member uh, for this question. Speaker, let's start with a stat. We've seen a 30% increase in women registration into apprenticeships. We're never going to build the homes and the hospitals, the highways, roads and bridges, leaving 50% of our workforce behind. That's why I'm proud to be part of a government taking common sense approaches and bringing it forward, like requiring properly fitting PPE to keep women safe on job sites, or other common sense changes. We know uh, 2022 Ontario Building and Construction Tradeswomen Survey, over half respondents said better uh, washroom facilities. Common sense changes like that would help make construction more appealing for women. While the opposition in debate uh, for a bill they ultimately supported, so I'm incredibly grateful for that, but while they mocked these common sense changes. Bonds. We're listening to women making the same expectations for washrooms on Bay Street to Mainstream, yeah. properly fitting PPE, and speaker, it's working. We're seeing women entering the trades in record numbers. Hey, yeah. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. The Associate Minister.